Uh, welcome everyone to the 2022 winter lecture series organized by the Georgia chapter of the American Statistical Association. It's my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Vijay Nair. He is the head of the advanced technologies for modeling at Wells Fargo. He is also the DA Darling Professor Emeritus of the University of Michigan. He was a professor of, the st of statistics and industrial and operations engineering at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor for 23 years. There he served as the chair of the statistics department from 1998 to 2010. Before joining the University of Michigan, he was a research scientist at the Bell Labs Math Science Center for 15 years. He is currently working in quantitative analytics and risk modeling leading a team in statistical learning and high-performance computing at Wells Fargo. Dr. Nair is a distinguished researcher and has received many awards. He is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, American Statistical Association, American Society for Quality, and Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Mathematical Statistics, yeah. He is a former president of the International Statistical Institute former chief editor of International Statistical Review and former editor of Technometrics. He has supervised 24 PhD students from industrial and operations engineering and statistics departments. We are very honored that he agreed to deliver this lecture today. As a token of our appreciation, we have a plaque for Vasan Nair. So I'll show you here and we'll send it to you later. Uh, without uh, further ado, we request Professor Nair to give the lecture today. Uh, um, all right. Thank you, Abudai. And uh, I see uh, Tian there. I can see his uh, face there. Hi, Tian. How are you? Uh, mustache is getting white now, right? Getting old. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Abudai, for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here, well, virtually, to talk to all of you. And uh, I will send the copies, uh, copy of the slides to Abudai after the presentation. So anybody who wants a copy can get it from him. Uh, can I ask you to mute your phones, please? So, because I'm hearing some noise on my end. Okay. Mute your uh, your uh, Zoom uh, calls, please. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so um, I uh, am, have been at uh, Wells Fargo for the last uh, six years, six plus years, and I've been doing. Uh, I have a team of about forty people looking at uh, uh, modeling, quantitative modeling, both in uh, what we call these days tabular data or structured data. Uh, unstructured or text data, as well as doing mathematical models, solving partial differential equations using numerical solvers, as well as Monte Carlo. So the, I have a variety of uh, people with a variety of backgrounds in my team. Uh, and in the last six plus years, you know, uh, maybe more, more in the last four years, I should say, we have gotten into uh, machine learning in a big way. Our, I'll talk about our applications. They're not very, very complex applications like images are very huge pattern recognition problems, but they are more dealing with uh, pretty large uh, data sizes. And I'm going to be talking about some of the applications. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, I would say high level overview presentation. It is not going to be very technical. And uh, I hope uh, it's of use to you. And uh, I will touch on an, a few research directions if I have time as I go through this. Uh, what's going on here? So, okay, here is an outline. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to go uh, start with a brief overview of uh, what people call machine learning and be focusing on what is also called supervised machine learning or in statistical terminology, regression and classification problems. Uh, and then I'll talk about why people are focusing on machine learning 
and some of the challenges, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have time to get into all of them, so I'll only talk about one of them, which is interpretability of these algorithms. Now, there is a lot of literature these days, and uh, I'm going to, uh, there is, uh, my talk is going to be based mostly on this one paper that appeared in International Statistical Review. It is uh, written jointly with my colleagues, uh, who at all the first one. And then there are a number of related uh, references that I've indicated here. Uh, the major players that you might recognize are Leo Bryman, who did random forest, and then Jerry Friedman, who did the gradient boosting, right? And then the other major area is neural networks, but those were done by people in computer science. <clears throat> so uh, let me talk a little bit about what the terms mean. It's going to be hard to define what these terms mean, but uh, the term machine learning uh, was coined by author uh, uh, Samuel, at, who was at IBM and later at some other places. It actually uh, has a, uh, whether machines can learn or not, goes back to uh, the uh, Second World War. And uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are talking about, you know, can we really, can machines really learn? Now, a, um, in non so intuitive definition is that machine learning gives computers the ability to learn without being expl explicitly programmed, right? So uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because it's not the computers that learn, it's the programming that, you know, it's the code that you write and the programs that adapt and learn, right? Uh, but perhaps a more useful, a more descriptive uh, description or definition is that it's a study and construction of algorithms that can learn from data, identify important features, recognize patterns, make predictions, and take action, right? And, and the actions are not taken by the machine itself, unless you're doing something like reinforcement learning. Often the actions are taken by people, right? Now, uh, there is a lot of confusion uh, in the common uh, literature or uh, uh, in the common uh, discussions about machine learning and artificial intelligence. People use the two terms interchangeably, but artificial intelligence is much broader and machine learning is a pathway to accomplishing the goals of AI. AI, loosely speaking, is concerned with making computers behave like humans, right? So, uh, that's what we say, uh, and to what extent it is done is, of course, a su uh, subject for debate. Uh, the term of, was coined by John McCarthy, he was at MIT around 1956. There was a, a big conference at uh, Dartmouth uh, in 56. A lot of people working in the area got together, and that was sort of the, the time that a lot of these things started happening. So if you want to put some words to describe what artificial intelligence is, you can say it is a study of intelligent agents. I put it in quotes because it's not clear what intelligent agents mean or systems that perceive the environment, take actions that maximize the probability of success to achieve some goal, right? That's sort of, again, a very loosely defined uh, 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 description. Uh, even though the term was defined, formally defined, uh, came, uh, became popular in 1956, or introduced in 1956, it has a long history, right? People have been talking about whether there is such a thing as artificial intelligence as opposed to human or natural intelligence for a long time. And it's got a reason in philosophy, logic, uh, mathematics, and all of that stuff well before the area of computer science, which is relatively recent, came about. And uh, it has gone through various periods. Uh, people have uh, called this AI winters. There have been periods where people have been very excited and there have been uh, periods where people said, no, we cannot do this and, and all of that stuff. But uh, there has been a huge resurgence of AI in the last uh, two decades, let's say, right? Maybe more so in the last decade. And that is really because there have been tremendous advances in computing power, as we all know, right? And then, of course, uh, you know, in, in associated with that is both the computing architectures and uh, and the availability to store, you know, collect, store, 
uh, manage, uh, move, uh, retrieve hu uh, huge amounts of data, right? That's really what has led to the resurgence of machine learning, led not resurgence, the big uh, you know, excitement in machine learning as well as artificial intelligence. And I'm, among all that, uh, you would have heard the term deep learning neural networks. So neural networks, I'll, I'll introduce it, but most of you uh, probably know about neural networks. And deep learning is a particular term that has really become very hot. And that is, uh, you know, it, it really means very complex neural networks. And I'll, I'll mention that later. So uh, for this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on what we call supervised learning, right? Regression and classification. The basic idea is that there are labels. We have some predictors and then we have some labels. We have training data and we can use that data to train our algorithm. And then for future data, we can use our algorithm to predict what the label is going to be, whether it is a member of a, of a class like zero one or a continuous variable, right? Uh, there are all these other uh, classes of uh, techniques called unsupervised learning, which we know, you know, uh, clustering and, and uh, low dimensional representations, uh, even outlier detection or anomaly detection. And then there is this huge area of reinforcement learning, which I'm not going to be able to talk about today. And there are many others, you know, the term learning has become very popular. We no longer teach, uh, you know, and we learn, right? Everybody learns. So um, let me start off with this uh, with this uh, page, which uh, I pretty much use in all my talks in the last uh, three to four years. Right? It's a it's a it's a way to talk about uh, what is statistical traditional what are traditional statistical methods and what are uh, machine learning methods. Right? And the the really great paper on this was by Leo Breimer in 2001, which is called Statistical Modeling in the Two Cultures, came out in Statistical Science. And uh, it's got these uh, two paradigms of what uh, Leo calls data model and algorithmic model, right? <clears throat> and uh, so yeah, that in traditional statistics, uh, many of us, at least people of my vintage, uh, grew up uh, when there was no machine learning. And so we operated under the following paradigm. And the paradigm is that we have a sample of data that was generated from some underlying population. And not oftentimes the underlying population is, is a figment of our imagination. There may be some real population sample surveys, but often it is some process that generates data, especially if it is about the future. And our goal is to understand how this model was, sample was generated so that we can make some conclusions about the population, right? So that's really what we are trying to do. And the goal here is, uh, you know, use the data to estimate the parameters, the generative model parameters, assess uncertainty, identify the key, what are the important uh, predictors, what are the input output relationships and all of that stuff. And typically, you know, in the old days, at least samples were small and now more moderate. So we fitted parametric models under some constraints, but these models advantages are easier to interpret, but the challenge is that they are not, uh, you know, they are not on parametric, so they are limited, right? So they can be biases. So along came machine learning, uh, you know, uh, as we said, you know, it was 1950s, but really it became more and more popular. I was in 1980s, 1990s and so on, right? Now in machine learning, uh, there is no notion of sample from some population, right? We have some data, we have some data set, right? And we want to be able to fit in, in a train an algorithm and fit that data set as well as we can. And the goal is to get best predictive performance, right? Best predictions. So it's all about predictions. It's not a necessarily about understanding the model. So what they do, what we do is that we take the data set of, and then we hold out, we hold out a, sample, a random sample. And then we train the model on the training data. And then we try to see how well it does on the holdout data. So, you know, uh, and that is really how our measure of how well the data set does predictive performance because we'll be overfitting on the training training data. So we, you know, and we'll be not overfitting on the holdout data. So any, you just compare different algorithms on our holdout, holdout data and see how well they do, right? So uh, this came about from the machine learning uh, community, be partly because they were actually collecting lots and lots of data and they were sitting around and they're saying, hey, we have all of these data sets. 
what can we do with it, right? And they were not subject matter experts, so they were not like statisticians working with some, you know, uh, subject matter experts or the, the the scientists or the practitioners. So they are, or for obvious reasons, they went to an algorithmic approach, right? I just want to be able to, you know, write some algorithms to do this prediction, right? And so the, it was very much an algorithmic approach, and they want to do this automation. Right, using algorithms to automate a lot of the things that we used to do in model building, right? Like variable selection, diagnostics, you know, all of that stuff, right? So all of these things, they took an algorithmic approach. The other thing that uh, characterized what they were doing is that they were typically leading, uh, dealing with data sets were much larger, moderate to large, much larger than we were, right? Hundreds of thousands, for example, and you know, 20s, 50s, hundreds of variables, right? predictors, right? There was, they were not really interested in things like confidence intervals, hypothesis testing. It's all about predictive performance and how good is my predictive performance was done on my whole data, right? There was no intrinsic interest in any data generation, generation process, right? Even if there's such a thing, because statisticians, I think for a long time, I must say that we've been over exaggerating this notion of a data generation mechanism, right? Now, what's happening recently, and I'll talk about this, is that model interpretability, interpretability of models is becoming important. So it's not just prediction, but you also under, want to understand models, which is what hap happens in our old uh, old world, right? Old parallel. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about supervised machine learning algorithms. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Abudai, can you give me an alert when I have about 10 minutes? Because I, I can't see my my. Uh... Please, please. Please. All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about supervised machine learning algorithms, and in two in in particular two things. Right, one is called ensemble algorithms, which are random forest and gradient boosting, were the main things, and then I'll talk about feed forward neural networks, which are a different class of algorithms. Now, the terminology in this field is becoming you know uh, becoming somewhat loose because these days. Many people say even logistic regression is machine learning, right? Because the computer science, the machine learning people are very generous people. So anything that was invented even, you know, uh, 50, 60s, 80 years ago, they, they say, oh yeah, we'll call it machine learning, right? But in, in our world, at least in my world, we, we, this is these are the main things. And of course, the other main thing is uh, support vector machines, which I'm not going to be talking about. Okay, so what are ensemble, ensemble algorithms? And uh, you know, what do we do originally? We have a original data set, right? So typically we can either hold out a little bit of the data set or we can take the entire data set and we fit a model on that. So we train that and then we come up with a fitted model, right? A fed of X, X are the inputs and we, this is our prediction in our uh, algorithm. And then if I get come up with a new, value, new uh, uh, input X star, let's say, I get a new customer uh, for whom we have to decide whether that person gets a mortgage, home mortgage loan or not. And that person has some credit attributes. So I plug in into my algorithm. I get my predicted probability. Pro pro uh, that's the probability that they will default. And then I'll use that to make a decision whether I should give a loan or not, right? That's really the sort of the traditional thing. Now, what's happening in this ensemble algorithm is that instead of just a single data set, uh, what's happening in both uh, random forest and boosting, we, from the single data set, we create multiple data sets. So we, tra uh, we train multiple algorithms on these different data sets. And then, uh, and then once we have created multiple data sets, we combine them somehow to get a, a, an overall model based on combining the multiple uh, prediction, uh, what they call learners. And then we got this algorithm. Now, the problem with this is that when you combine them like this, they are much harder to interpret, right? That's going to be the one of the big themes of my talk. So what happens in random forests? Again, uh, apologies for those of you who are very familiar with this area. I, I will, I'm just setting the stage so that we, we have a level setting for every, everything that we do later, right? In random forest, what you do is you take in the original data set, and then you get bootstrap samples of these, right? You get multiple bootstrap samples and the bootstrap samples can be uh, uh, samples of the rows as well as um, samples of the columns, right? You can do row sampling as well as column sampling. And then you get these multiple bootstrap samples and then you fit a uh, an algorithm. Typically what you do is you fit a tree, 
right? Uh, you fit a tree, a piecewise constant tree, and then you average them, right? You average them to get the ensemble model, right? So why do we do this, right? What was uh, Leo Breimann's original motivation? So if you fitted a tree, a single tree, uh, if you fitted a deep tree, what happens is that the, uh, the deeper you go, the better you, the model is, but it's highly unstable, meaning each tree, uh, each tree has small bias if it is deep, but it's a large variance, right? It's an unstable tree. So the idea uh, Bryman had was to create, you know, to grow multiple trees and you average them to reduce variance, right? And you average them, and there are a number of ways of averaging issues there, and which I'm not get, going to get into, right? So that's why it's called bootstrap aggregation or bagging, right? So, and as I said, you can do row subsampling, column subsampling, and there are a number of uh, decisions you have to make, how deep your trees are, and how many trees you go, what's the row sampling, column sampling ratio, and all that. These are called hyperparameters that have to be uh, what people call tuned separately outside of this algorithm, right? Now, uh, Leo, brought, I mean, Jerry Friedman came up with a different idea. Actually, I should say the idea of boosting predates, uh, predates uh, Jerry. Boosting was done by some computer scientists who were at Bell Labs uh, at the time. And uh, Leo Bryman showed that the idea of boosting, which I'll talk about in a minute, is really uh, very similar to uh, gradient descent, really optimizing a loss function using a particular algorithm called gradient descent. So uh, Leo wrote that paper in 1996, and then Jerry, uh, uh, once he read that, he exploited that to take other boosting, which is the original algorithm of Shapira and Freund, and he came up with a more general algorithm, which is called gradient boosting. And what has happens in gradient boosting? This is the way it is done. You take the original data set, you fit an overall mean model, right? Simple model. That's the, if, there, if the observations are yi continuous, then these things are just y bar. And then you take the residuals from the mean model, right? And then you fit a, another tree. And these trees are called weak learners. And then you fit a tree. And then you take the residuals from the combined residuals from the combined model. And then you take the residuals, you fit another tree, and so on, right? And these individual trees are called weak learners. And the question is, if I actually, can I, you know, if a bunch of weak learners, can I improve on them? And that's really what the paper by Shapira, who was at, at Bell Labs now at Princeton, showed that you can indeed do this. It's, it's a very amazing result. It seemed very counterintuitive when I first read it, but there it is. It's a very, very major result. And uh, the idea in boosting is that, you know, you, you grow short trees because they have, you know, so that short trees have low variance, but big bias. But by boosting, meaning you're refitting to the, to the residuals, you are actually adjusting for the bias. And then the boosting up, does the updates in the direction of the negative gradient, right? So that is why it's called gradient boosting, right? Boosting reduces bias. And then again, there are many so-called hyperparameters that you have to uh, train them, and, and I'll mention how to do that later. Okay. Now those are the true uh, major algorithms, and uh, in some studies that we've done, we and a lot there's a lot of work done, but we just recently uh, did a very a big uh, ex, uh, empirical study of random forest. XG boost and and the neural networks. We'll talk about. It turns out that gradient boosting does uh, generally much better than random forest. So at least in our applications, we don't use random forest that much. A, a gradient boosting does really well. And there is a particular, there are many implementations of gradient boosting in the literature that are called XGBoost, uh, CatBoost, AdaBoost, and so on, right? They're all really good, good algorithms. The XGBoost version it seems to be the most popular one. Okay. The, the the other algorithm I'm going to be talking about is feed-forward neural networks, right? So what are neural networks? Neural networks have many layers. So here's an architecture of what we call a feed-forward neural network. So you have inputs, right? You can have N inputs, I have only three. So let's suppose you have uh, three very, three predictors, right? You have X1 to Xn, and uh, you know, in each one of them, you let's say there are 100,000 observations, so this will be 100,000 dimensional vector, this one 100,000, 100,000, right? But again, you can have many more than three input, right? And then each, the inputs are each uh, goes to the hidden layer. There are some hidden layers, 
and they get combined in some way. And I'll mention how they get combined. So each one of these gets this input and, and combined in some way at these hidden layers. And then the outputs of this may go to another hidden layer, may or may not, right? And they, they get combined in some way. And then there may be many hidden layers. And these each one of these are called neurons. And you know, so the parameters are how many neurons I have and how many layers I have. And then at the, at the last, the penultimate layer, all of these get combined into getting an output y hat, right? And this usually is a predictor, right? It's a score in the binary case, uh, continuous observation predictor in the continuous response case, right? So that's how the, uh, this happens. And the idea here is really, you know, obviously the original idea was to mimic how your brain works, right? The neural networks. So let me just tell you the, the simple idea and each, what happens in each one. So you have my inputs coming in at each one of these neurons and they all weighted, right? Weighted to get a Z, right? This is a weight, uh, weighted combination of these axes. And then you apply something called an activation function, right? And there are many activation functions. So basically what happens is that you take this W1 to W2, W3, you take the linear combination, you apply a, an activation function and that's what goes from you know here to here and then here to here, right? That's that's really what happens. And there are many different activation functions, but you can see this this connection here, G of W uh, transpose X, is very much like what we call additive index models in in statistics, and this is also what's called projection pursuit by uh, early papers of Jerry Friedman, right, and John Tukey. So uh, what is a deep neural network? Deep neural network can be many things, right? They can, you know, so in a feed forward neural network, you go only in this direction, right? You go from here to here, and then here to here, and every layer, every neuron is connected to every other neuron in, in, the, in the next layer. And they can be, if you have many, many of these, that's called deep neural networks, many layers. Sometimes you may have you know, more complicated structures going on. You can go this way and then you might go back and so on. And that's are called convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks, long short-term memory and all that. And then uh, these days in, uh, in uh, natural language processing, there are very, very complex neural networks. One, one example is something called BERT bidirectional encoder representations from transformers and the num you know and the number of uh, hyperparameters in the in this can go into billions right and it's not clear to me when you have a model billion hyperparameters what it is really doing but that's beyond my comprehension okay as i said you know there are, you have to uh, optimize those hyperparameters and there are many techniques in the literature and i'm not going to spend time on that okay okay now i've set the stage for the the three most common types of algorithms that we use uh, in very, very complex uh, uh, pattern recognition problems and image analysis, people almost always use neural networks, very complex, uh, you know, very uh, deep, what they call deep learning neural networks. And then if you have, for example, time series data and you want uh, time series predictors, I should say, but predictors that are time series, uh, you need to do feature engineering. People use, uh, you know, uh, uh, deep learning neural networks to actually take those time series and, and, and summarize them and create new features out of the time series, right? But in our world, uh, we use both simple, these kind of simple neural networks, uh, feed forward neural networks, and we also use gradient boosting. Those are the two go-to algorithms in our world, right? Because our, in our uh, applications in banking, and let me just talk about some of the uh, applications, right? One of the big things that we, you all, everybody knows about is credit risk, right? So, you know, uh, Wells Fargo, for example, is a big uh, uh, credit company, meaning uh, mortgages, automobile loans, credit cards, right? That's our bread and butter. We are not as much of a, investment banking company like, uh, like for example, uh, uh, JP Morgan and Chase. So, uh, you know, so we have, you know, trillions of dollars of uh, mortgages, a lot, I mean, credits, uh, loans out there. And we have to worry about whether how much of that we're going to, you know, people are going to default. And so that's a big, big thing that we do, right? And so each kind of uh, product has has a model. We have, we have lots and lots of models we use to predict losses. Credit decisions, another one that is related to who gets the loan, right? A lot of people 
uh, apply for loans. And, you know, it's it's a funny thing, right? We, we, we don't want to get, you know, in, in a sense, we don't make money off people who are really, really good because they pay off your loan. Uh, and we don't want people who are defaulting, right? So it's people on the margins who are actually not paying off their loan every month who end up paying a lot of interest. That's really where you know banks make money, right? But we we have to predict. Uh, we don't want too many too much bad credit, right? So that's really where the credit decision models happens. You all may be familiar with this. A lot of it is logistic regression and now more machine learning, right? And then uh, modeling revenue and transactions, financial crimes is a big thing. Fraud is a big thing. Money laundering is a big thing, right? The big, the new area that we're interested in is text and speech. Uh, we got a lot of emails from customers. We get a lot of complaints from customers. We got to analyze them in more or less real time to figure out, you know, are these communications with customers, are they real complaints? And if so, what kind of complaints so that we can take action, right? And this is a big growing area. Uh, chatbots like Siri and Alexa, also a big area. We, we are not really developing our own chatbots, but we take the standard state of our algorithm, we apply them, we, uh, we adapt them to applications, but we got to figure out how good they are for our applications, right? So, um, you know, what kind of techniques we use? In the old days, it was clustering, you know, outlier anomaly detection, parametric modeling, you know, semi and non parametric regression models, lasso, ridge, all of that stuff was already there when I came to the bank six years ago, right? But now the new focus is that, you know, the lot, it used to be that, you know, the, the algorithms could not handle huge amounts of data. We have hundreds of millions of accounts, of observations in some cases, right, accounts. So a lot of the traditional algorithms couldn't handle that kinds of data, but now there are algorithms that can handle it, right? And many of the traditional algorithms don't scale up. So, so we have to wait for people to scale them up. Or, you know, there's a lot of open source algorithms now, particularly in Python, that we can use, uh, you know, uh, by, uh, uh, all, all kinds of uh, uh, scikit-learn is the word I'm trying to write. That's an open source algorithm. So uh, there is a lot of new focus on trying to do modeling on much larger number of observations, also much larger number of predictors. In you know, previously we used to go through laborious, uh, you know, manually intensive ways to take these thousands of predictors and reduce them to you know 20 or even 15 or something like this right and oftentimes you know we would not even look at this right we would just you know say rule out a lot of this but now people are asking hey you know we were doing this uh, just by uh, you know the old way old ways of doing things but are there there is the information some of these predictors right that's that's one question the other question is that you know to to actually go through the old ways of doing things when you have let's say millions even tens of millions of observations and hundreds of predictors doing variable selection looking for interactions all of that stuff is not it's not really practical so the the promise of doing automated or semi automated feature engineering is a big big plus in two modelers uh, of course not you know there is no free lunch as we say right a lot of these things comes at 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 a at a big cost in particular the big uh, you know the big wrench in the in the whole thing is is multicollinearity or high correlations right and then, as I said, there is also modeling new new types of data, right? So we have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, we are, there is a lot of emphasis here on looking at machine learning algorithms. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, our bread and bat butter are still uh, these kinds of traditional algorithms. We are just getting into these. We are looking to see, you know, how good they are. How what are the useful usefulness? Do they get it? Give us better predictive performance? how robust they are, can we explain the results, and all of that stuff, right? So, so we are still, you know, and then the other thing that we have to do is that when we develop a model, the model is developed by one group of people and it is challenged by another group of people and they're called model uh, validators. And the people who validate the models, they actually have to come up with benchmark models. So they develop their own models. So often they use machine learning algorithms to come up with uh, challenge models, right? So that's the context in which a lot of these things are being applied, okay? Um, any any quick question here? So I can just wait for a second and see if people have any, any questions. 
Yeah, everybody is muted, so unmute if you have any questions. Okay, we will continue then. Let me just give a very simple example, just to again, uh, you know, uh, make things concrete. One of the big things we do is what we call modeling uh, in trouble loans, right? In trouble means that the loan can be, we, we think that there are uh, all kinds of problems that can happen. For example, somebody can go bankrupt. Uh, delinquency means that somebody is not paying the loan, you know, several months, you're not paying the minimum on several months in a row. You know, and then the other thing that we also worry about is prepay. When somebody pays off the loan, we lose the servicing rights, right? So we have to just uh, look at all of these possible ways the loan can end. So these are multiple failures. And those of you who work in reliability or some other analysis, you know, can think about this as a there's a connection to competing risks, right? The loan can be in trouble and can fail due to any one of these things. And I'm not going to uh, get into the details of that. So let's talk about the loan failing due to any one of these failure modes. And uh, we have in this particular example, we have uh, you know over 20 predictors, and I'm just listing some of them here. Credit history. So this is home mortgage, right? So we are talking about whether uh, this particular group of people who have a home mortgage, you know, and we have about five. I, I we took a small a sub sample of five million accounts out of this. And the question is, you know, uh, can we model this and say, and come up with a predictive model for people, def uh, people, you know, uh, uh, defaulting for one reason or another, right? So, uh, you know, we have the usual kinds of things, the credit history, the type of loan, loan amount, loan age, and, you know, all of that stuff, right? So the way these, this modeling works is that, you know, uh, we are, let's say we are here, we are here now at 2022, and the loan may have originated some, you know, let's say five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. And this origination time varies loan by loan. And then we are here, right? And so we have the, uh, information over this period, information over this uh, the origination time, as well as uh, all, you know, as well as what we call snapshot time, you know, current time. And then how the loan amount has been paid off, uh, how the loan to value ratio is changing, how the interest rate is changing and all that. And at this point, we want to predict, okay? We want to make a prediction, right? We want to make a multiple prediction. There is a one particular horizon. I want to predict, let's say one quarter ahead, two quarters ahead, three quarters ahead, four quarters ahead, and so on, right? So I want to predict for this, each loan, I want to be able to predict what is the probability that it will default, right? And we have to develop a model and the, and the loans are very, you know, can be very heterogeneous. We got to combine all of them and then we got a whole bunch of predictors associated with that, and we want to predict this, right? So we want to take into account origination time. So there are multiple time times involved, here, right? You know, so multi-dimensional time, right? Origination time, snapshot time, and then of course we want a prediction horizon, okay? And uh, so just to give you, and I'm not going to get into the details. This is just a, a, again for that data set. I'm just going to show you the results of fitting four different models, right? So the first model is logistic regression. That's the, that's a blue curve. Green is uh, gradient, gradient boosting. Random forest is red and feed forward neural network is just this sort of uh, bluish uh, green color, right? And this is uh, what you, you all, we all might uh, know for, for binary data response, the, the usual thing is that the, you know, the ROC curve, right? That's really what we use. And ideally you want this curve to go up and be flat, right? And go up to one as quickly as possible, but that rarely does. And this curve, you know, so what you have is the, you look at for, you know, controlling different false positive rates, what is a true positive rate? And, you know, ideally, as I said, it needs to go up, go up and, and then to one and then be flat, but that never happens. This dash line is the 45 degree line. That's what you get by random guessing, right? So, and then you can compute, people typically compute the area under the curve. And that's really what I have in, you know, the summary numbers here. And if you look at the area under the curve, you can see logistic regression gets 0.83, boosting gets 0.87, random forest point gets 0.86, uh, feed for little gets 0.86. And so there is an increase of 0.04, that's something like four to 5% over logistic regression, right? That's an improvement of, of people in the business call it a lift. OK, so that's the kind of things that, you know, that that happened in this example. Right. So 
so you might ask, you know, is it really worth, worth this, right? Is the, is the 5% improvement here, is that really a big deal, right? Now, what, what we find in our, in our applications is that if you do a very mature application and this kind of application, uh, credit loss prediction is very mature because we've been, people have been doing this for years now, right? So we understand the predictors we understand what is the you know, right transformations or feature engineers, we call it, what are the right interactions and all that. So you know, you typically you don't actually get much big gain over the traditional classical logistic regression, right? That's 0.83. You get about three, four, 5% or even a little bit more, right? That's the kind of lift you can expect. However, what we found is that if you're now moving to a new application, where we don't have as much subject matter historical experience, I should say, then you don't really know how to do feature engineering, how to transform, how to, what variables are important, you know, which variables to choose. And if you have 50, 60 variables to choose from, the problem becomes very challenging. And this is really where, in our experience, machine learning pays a dividend and it can pay a big, much bigger dividend than what I'm showing you here. Okay, now this is an example of natural language processing. As I said, that's the, another big area that we work on, but I'm not going to get into that. We don't have time. Hey, uh, Abudai, how much time do I have left? I have. The talk is for one hour, so it is only 4.40, 42 hours. So you have like 12, 12, 13 minutes. Okay. So I don't have a lot of time to get into the details, but so let me try to just be a high level here, right? So what are the opportunities? Why are, why are people interested in machine learning? And I can only talk about my space, which is the banking space, right? You know, as we all know, as I mean, looking at more generally, the so-called big data uh, a phenomenon that happened, uh, everybody was talking about big data about 10 years ago, right? It sort of died down now. Uh, one of the big things is that we got new sources of data, right? Social media data, sensor network data, transportation systems, right? People driving around and anytime you hit a bump, right? The car can sense a signal saying that, hey, I hit a bump, right? Or there is, there is a traffic jam or something, right? And text data, conversation data. So there's a lot of ex excitement about this. And what turned out was that the traditional way of doing business, which is traditional uh, statistical models, parametric models or even, even the so-called you know, uh, semi-parametric models were limited in what can they do, right? And because we have so much data, we can try more elaborate, uh, flexible algorithms, right? And then along with the big data, we had a, lots of advances in computing and data storage technologies that made possible to develop very fast algorithms, right? Scalable algorithms for large data sets and also store and move data very fast and all that, right? So, so that's really the, the domain in which machine learning thrived and people have been, have been doing it and have been using it, right? Uh, but I must say there's also a lot of false promises uh, in my opinion, right? And, and I'll, I'll talk about it in, in, if I have time, right? So there are a lot of major challenges. Let me just talk a little bit, some of them here, right? The major challenges is that, you know, it all hinged on this uh, premise that we all we do is, uh, is prediction. So for example, if you are Netflix or you are Amazon or you're some company, you're interested in a recommender system and you want to tell people, oh, you read this book. So let's, you can, you might also be interested in that book, you know, and if your algorithm, you know, does some very funny stuff, you know, internally, you know, it's not a big deal, right? Because, you know, a recommender system gets it wrong sometimes, right? But if you're making credit decisions, Right. By legally, we are allowed to, we have to record to tell people if I, if you don't get a loan, why you didn't get a loan. So we have to explain our model, not only to customers, but to regulators. You know, banks are regulated, heavily regulated, right? Similarly, if you're doing surgery, right? If you, uh, you know, complex surgery and you're using some machine learning, I don't think people do that now, but if you did it, something goes wrong, what happens? You don't understand the algorithm, right? Even autonomous driving, right? I mean, there was a big brouhaha excitement hoopla on autonomous driving, right? Uh, but now people are pulling back. Ford, for example, has spent billions of dollars and they're basically closing down or scaling back a lot of their driving, autonomous driving, right? So the promises on a lot of the promises on uh, on machine learning, which basically said, you know, you, it's all prediction, you know, you hold out data and all of that stuff. 
doesn't is not quite right. And the other thing is that you know we are always using historical data to predict the future, and the future changes changes a lot, right? You don't really know because you know when you are developing an autonomous driving algorithm, the question is that it has the algorithm seen all of the patterns it's going to see. Is it going to mix up a you know a, a, a stop sign for something else, a school sign for something else, right? And how is it going to look at differentiate between night and day, right? So the algorithm is only as good as the data it has seen. And oftentimes, you know, you cannot be 100% foolproof, right? And that's really why you see all of these accidents that have happened with autonomous driving, right? So the one big thing that we've been uh, focusing on is uh, this notion of explainability or interpretability, right? And as I said, this is very important in our line of business, which is regulated. So if we come up with an algorithm to make decisions, we need to be able to tell our, both our stakeholders, and we have many of them, right? Our business users, our customers, our regulators, what you have to explain the model, right? And the problem with this FF of X using these ensemble algorithms on neural networks, it is not explicitly defined. You don't have a formula, right? And you don't really know that is there is no it's not parameterized really in, a, in the usual sense. It's implicitly implicitly defined. All I can do is that I you give me an X, I can tell you what the prediction is, but and it's very high dimensional, especially in machine learning. People are saying, well, I can work with 20, 30, 40, 50 dimensions, right? So people say think that you know you can you can walk in that that high dimensional space, but really something in a fifty dimensional space is not very easy to understand, let alone explain, right? So the issue is not just prediction, right? You know, like recommended systems detecting fraud, and so we have a dual goals: good predictive performance, and we need to be able to understand and explain the model, right? That's really the problem. So. Uh, there have been a number of techniques that are, that have developed uh, by people, you know, in the literature going back to Leo Bryman's paper and even uh, Jerry Friedman's papers and since, on and uh, fitting a model and, and trying to understand uh, using things called variable importance techniques to uh, to say which one of the variables are important, uh, uh, what is the input output relationship, and all of that stuff. But but all of these things are not have. Have potentially have a lot of problems, right? And that's really why people are now looking at what's called inherently interpretable algorithms. And I'm going to go through this very fast and very quickly. So variable variable importance is is a way, you know, in in that home mortgage example, I have 20 plus variables. Which ones are the most important? And for example, this is your FICO score, right? Your that's your credit score. This is your loan to value ratio. It looks like these are the two important variables, right? And there are many ways to compute variable importance. The most uh, most uh, common ways use permutations. And then input output relationships, you can you know, compute something called partial dependence plots, you know, and for example, you can see, hey, this is the input uh, relationship in loan to value ratio and my predicted log, log odds of my predicted probability. And you can see it's flat over here and then it's linear over here, for example, right? So you can do all of that. But the, the challenge all of in, you know, there are local explainability and I don't have time to, I'm gonna skip through some slides. Uh, here is the problem, right? What are we doing here, right? Uh, so let's take this uh, surface. Right? It's a fairly smooth surface, right? And uh, you know, and I'm only looking at two dimensions here, right? So if I actually, if I want to uh, explain this in one dimension, what is the input output relation in this dimension? I have to project it across this, essentially average them. If I average them across this space, all of these complexities, right? The dip is going to go away may not go away, you might have something like this, I mean, going down and up, but I, I completely cannot understand this, right? And similarly here, and this is only two dimensions. What if this is in 10 dimensions, right? Any lower dimensional explanation is, you know, going to be uh, necessarily incomplete and can be misleading, right? This is the problem when you're trying to do very high dimensional model fed, but you, we are limited in visualizing and understanding this, right? That's one of the problems. The other problem is many of these, you know, what is the difference between, are we, are we modeling? Are we fitting a function? Because many of these algorithms are, are really trying to fit something like this. They are really, you know, the more data you have, you know, the more flexible your algorithm is, it's going to look, you know, capture all of these small little thingies here, right? 
So that is that a really a model? Is that going to generalize? Do you want something smoother like this? Because there is a whole issue of function fitting versus modeling, right? And a lot of these algorithms try to capture these very fine details because we have tons of data, right? And they end up not being good in uh, you know, extrapolating, predict, predicting the future, right? So that is the other issue. And a third issue is correlation. When, and I'm not even going to get into the details here, but correlation creates havoc, right? And, and the thing is, uh, if you are a traditional statistician, you know, uh, I'm sorry, not a traditional statistician. In the old days, we were painstakingly, we looked at multicollinearity, we decided, hey, two variables are highly correlated, you know, which one should I keep? Should I throw out them, uh, one of them? Or should I combine them somehow in, you know, using some kind of dimension reduction like PCA or something, right? We did all of that careful stuff. Now machine learning offers this promise. It says, don't worry all of that. Okay, don't worry about any of that. I, the algorithm will do everything for you, right? And we can handle 100, 100 variables, 50 variables, right? But when you have so many variables, they many of them are necessarily going to be correlated. And some of the correlations we see are very high, 0 0.9, 0 0.95, you know, like that, right? So, so what happens in that case, right? Let's take a look at a simple model like this, X1 and X2. Suppose it's a linear, you know, beta one X1 plus beta two X2 plus an interaction term like this, right? Suppose X1 and X2 are highly correlated, okay? X1 and X2 are correlated, right? So what does that mean? X1, so suppose in the extreme case, X2 is equal to X1, right? So this will be X1 squared or X2 squared. So is this an interaction or is that a quadratic term, right? So in the extreme case, of course, X1 squared, X2 squared, but what if there is 90% correlation or even 80% correlation, right? So this is a model that is really not identifiable in the presence of high correlation, right? So that is part of the problem. We are fitting models to data and, and there are many models can, that can fit the data equally well. So when you start interpreting this, what is it that you're interpreting, right? So this is part of the, part of the challenge. There are, these are known problems with statisticians as I put in here, right? That's why we have developed a lot of model agnostics. But the view in machine learning is to throw in as many predictions as possible into the mix and automate model building. And they don't care about uh, about things like this. If you're a predictor, if you want, just want to predict, it doesn't matter. But if you want to interpret, different ball game altogether, right? Okay. My, uh, I'm going to, I got two more slides uh, over there. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, what people are doing these days, one of the things happening, man, there are many things happening. One of the things happening is that, hey, we need to come up with models that are inherently interpretable, right? I mean, they, they used to call in a, the different terms, but I think we came up with this term inherently interpretable, but others may claim credit as well. Now, what is the, what are the key things by interpretability, right? You want a model that is parsimonious, you know, means that very fewer active effects and not very high order interactions, right? So, the problem with complex model, machine learning models is that, you know, we want, the goal has been to extract as much predictive performance as possible, no emphasis on interpretation, but when you have a very complex model and you rely on low dimensions, some ways you're going to miss the big picture, right? So the emerging view, at least in uh, tabular data, at least in the world that we live in, which is not very, very complicated, uh, pr uh, pattern recognition problems, not image problems. We don't really have very high, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, very complex uh, uh, situations. People are saying, you know, let's just restrict our sense, go away from these very complex models, but, uh, you know, restrict ourselves to low order functional model. Uh, you know, so for example, you can fit main effects and second order interactions only, but main effects and second order interactions are not parametric. They're still non-parametric, they're functional, right? And uh, so, you know, and this view is not new in statistics. It's been around, right? Goes back, uh, you know, a long time. We, you know, and if you go back to work of Grace Warba, for example, at uh, Wisconsin, you know, they, they have done something called, you know, functional ANOVA and fitted it using spline models, right? What is new in machine learning is that we are using the machinery or architecture of uh, of uh, neural networks of boosting to fit these functional models, right? 
So for example, right, let's suppose you, you we can take any function model and we can decompose it into main if overall mean and main effects and second order second order functional. So this remember these are functions. And let's suppose we can assume that these things in higher order are small. So we end up fitting these models and uh, we call you know functional ANOVA models with lower interactions. And you can use them. You can use some of this new new uh, architecture to fit them. And there are two, uh, there are several papers in the literature. One is called E Explainable Boosting Machine. This uh, paper is 2019. This came out of uh, Microsoft Research. And then we have two other papers, one called GAMI, GAMI uh, Generalized Additive Machines with Interactions. That's what GAMI means, right? So GAM with inter uh, pairwise interactions. We have neural nets and trees, and uh, these are people, you know, my team that did this work. And uh, so we have been doing that. And then uh, I'm not going, I don't have time to get in the details and show you the results of these. And then there are also other kinds of lower order models. And the other kind of models, which is what I talked about, right? This additive index models. So, you know, think about GAM, right? Your function can be approximated by additive, funct additive functions, right? Additive in each variable, but instead of additive in each variable, you can actually have make it additive in, you know, and beta, you know, it's in a linear combination. And this is called additive index models. And as I said, this are also used to be called projection pursuit regression, paper by Friedman, Jerry Friedman and Wanna uh, Stutzler, who are at, out of Stanford in 1981, right? So, and we have a paper using neural networks to fit this kind of models and uh, two years ago, that's been published. So uh, let me just summarize, right? So uh, what I've tried to give you, you know, is really a whirlwind tour, so to speak, right? That uh, there has been a lot of development in machine learning, and uh, what are the reasons in general, and what is it the reason? What are the reasons in the banking? And uh, you know, as I said, large data sets, uh, machine, you know, ML fits flexible models and their better predictive performance. They offer the promise of automated feature engineering selection. And there are also new sources of data like text data for which you know, necessarily the, the usual uh, statistical models can, uh, are not useful. And then, but there are many, many challenges. I talked about interpretability. One of the other things that people are very concerned about these things is fairness and bias. You know, because you are now, uh, you know, uh, handing over the responsibility of model training to algorithms, are they going to build in the historical biases in the data? And some of you may have heard about stories about the uh, Apple card, for example, where, you know, this card was actually the husband and uh, spouses, right? Let's say partners in a house, let's say husband and wife, and husband and wife submit, uh, you know, uh, ask for a credit card and you know, husband gets it and wife gets uh, refused. And uh, the, 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 particular, the bank that was using it has claimed that you know, they were not using machine learning, but a lot of, lot of claims otherwise. But the point here is that particularly when they're giving loans, right? We had to worry about are our procedures fair? You know, are they biased towards particular groups, right? So uh, those are the kinds of challenges that we are working on. So let me stop here over there. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay, for the wonderful talk. And I will open the floor for uh, questions, comments. We already have one question from the audience in the chat box. So Dr. Huang, if you could uh, repeat your question, that will be good. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the uh, great presentation. So my question is, uh, when you talk about the banking data, so I, in my opinion, uh, they are highly imbalanced. Uh, so I'm wondering when you show the AO, uh, ROC curve uh, and see a little increase from the linear logistic regression model compared to the more fancy uh, machine learning techniques. So is it more relevant to instead using the precision recall curve uh, in, in comparison of these performance? Well, you know, that's a very focused uh, technical question, right? If you're interested, we can talk about in what, what we do with imbalance, right? We, we have a major research project on imbalance data. What do we do and what is the right metric, right? In this particular case, right? We, we off, you know, that you, you probably know, right? That, that you definitely know there are ways to try to address imbalance and, uh, you know, whether AUC is the right metric 
or should we use other metrics? Right? These are all good questions, but but I'm I'm happy to talk to you offline about that. It's not really directly relevant to my presentation here. Other comments and questions, Sriram? Yeah, uh, so given the paradigm shift, I mean, you in your talk itself, you uh, presented the first part of it was the classical statistics and the, the machine learning approaches. So uh, if you were 50 years younger, uh, uh, actively involved as a faculty member, what would you be advocating for your course for, for coursework for your graduate students? Well, you know, that's a good question. And I'm not sure, uh, Tian, if we have talked about this already, right? I think, I think, I mean, we may have talked about it in the context of a data science program at some point. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I think most people in academia believe, and I agree with that, although I'm probably more applied than, more, you know, the typical academic these days, you need a very strong, solid background in, uh, you know, in obviously uh, probability, uh, you know, mathematics, which is, you know, algebra and calculus. And, you know, and and now the thing that we we didn't do, what we uh, do it in my time is uh, coding, programming, right? And then not just programming, you need to understand the computing environments which we operate, right? We need to, you need to understand, uh, you know, a lot of the things that Google puts out like TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, all of that stuff, right? What makes computing, what makes uh, computing architectures, all of that stuff, right? And you, obviously you can't be an expert in everything, but you can actually, uh, you you know, you have to pick and choose, but you need to be, you know, I would say you need to be generalist across the border, at least for your first degree and even your master's degree, right? Now, uh, but uh, of statistical techniques, I do think people need a very strong foundations in regression, right? And multivariate analysis like classification, clustering and all that, right? And a lot of these techniques just build on that, right? Because one of the things that I'm finding that we are hiring people, I know, uh, who are a lot of engineering degrees, who don't have the solid background and they just, uh, they just come up with algorithms they try out, but they don't understand why. So we have to tell them, we have to teach them, we've got to train them, right? So that is not something I would recommend going away from, right? So I would say you need to add courses, right? Uh, I mean, a lot of these things are now available in open source. So I think we need to have more courses, more, uh, you know, data sets where people try out different things. And, and people, students, I would say students need to be more creative, right? Don't just sit in an office and think that the uh, faculty members are going to teach you everything. That's not how it operates, right? You, we are not going to, you know, nobody teaches you everything. You need to do, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of the learning by yourself. There's mm -hmm. a lot of resources out there. Try it out, right? Learn about these algorithms, try them out, you know, and look at answers, right? And then try to interpret them, right? So we need to do all of that, right? But of course, we have to give away something. What do you have to give away? I would give away theoretical courses on stochastic processes and, you know, measure theory. I would give away a lot of uh, theoretical courses on hypothesis testing, you know, all of these very theoretical courses that, you know, which I haven't used in my, you know, since I left graduate school 40 plus years ago. So you need to give up, you know, very esoteric stuff, but you need to have the foundation so that you understand a lot of the things. Without the foundations, you know, you're just, uh, you know, a hacker, you're a hack, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, yes, this was very good advice. Okay, I think we are over time. I'm sorry, uh, you know, that I ran over, but uh, okay. <laughs>